Hi guys and thanks for watching. This is Alan Gardner, Senior Lecturer in the School of Sport and Health Sciences at University of Central Lancashire and this is part two of a two-part series on headache and this, uh, section, this, this part is all about secondary headaches. In part one I went over uh, some primary headaches and if you haven't watched that yet, it's worth uh, going back to part one and taking a look at that. Um, I defined the differences between primary and secondary headaches. So I've said that primary headache is a headache in the absence of a un significant underlying pathology. Contrasting to that uh, are secondary headaches, and these are essentially uh, red flag headaches. So where there's, there is the presence of some serious um, underlying pathophysiology and in this uh, very quite brief overview of uh, secondary headaches I'm only going to focus on three of them there are many other um, secondary headaches uh, on the next slide we're actually going to go over well the next two slides there's some uh, screening or diagnostic uh, considerations and then I'm going to go through meningitis uh, and mainly the, the headache present in meningitis as opposed to meningitis as a whole. Um, and that's the same for subarachnoid hemorrhage and the headache um, present in some space occupying lesions. Now these are enormous subjects, so there's some background reading to be done alongside this. And I will provide some references alongside these videos that will help you do some additional reading for this. So red flags and the signs of secondary headache. We have this really useful acronym, the SNOOP uh, mnemonic. And as you can see here, that this comes from Smith 2018. Uh, but you can find it in other articles as well. It's quite a commonly used uh, mnemonic just to, to remind you of the, uh, the, the signs and um, associated or un underlying conditions that might predispose patients to developing uh, secondary headache. Starting with S, we're looking for any other systemic signs or disorders. So in particular, thinking about uh, physiological observations that with, with primary headache, we don't see um, sort of dr dramatic changes in physiological observations, whereas we'd be watching out for uh, hypo or hypertension, um, tachycardia with uh, secondary headache. Another good example is the fever that we see with meningitis. Uh, we're going to be looking for some focal neurological symptoms. Now in part one we mentioned that with meningitis, for uh, sorry no not meningitis, for, with um, uh, migraine for example in part one uh, we mentioned that there there are some visual changes, for example, with visual aura. Uh, we were saying that there, there's negative visual aura where people uh, lose visual fields. Um, with secondary headache, we're looking for other gross signs of neurological deficit. Examples might include diplopia, so double vision uh, or vertigo. Any changes to the gait or power deficits in any of the limbs. Moving on to O, uh, the first of the, of, of the O's here, which is the onset being a, a new headache or in patients with previous um, uh, long-term headache disorders, if, if this is a, a different type of headache, if there's, if there's changes, then that's gonna be significant here. And, um, and in particular, differentiating between uh, a previous headache and a, uh, and a new experience of headache, it's really important to question the patient as to whether or not this is the, the type of headache that they're used to, or, or does it feel different to the, uh, to the headache that they've had previously. Uh, moving on to the, the next O, it says on onset in thunderclap presentation. Now that's referring specifically to a, a rapid onset um, of, uh, of, of headache that's referred to as this, this thunderclap. So it's going to come on extremely rapidly and we'll talk a bit more about this when we get to uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, papilledema, pulsatile tinnitus, positional provocation um, and precipitated by exercise. So Papal edema is a, it's a swelling of the optic disc that we'll see on fundoscopy. It's one of the signs of increased intracranial uh, pressure. 
Uh, pulsatile tinnitus is one of the or one of various types of, of tinnitus, a, uh, a sound that people hear in their ears that this is there are different types of tinnitus. They can be sort of ringing sounds or, um, or buzzing sounds or it, specifically with regard to pulsatile tinnitus, it tends to be uh, a, a little bit like hearing your own heartbeat. Now that they can be caused by different things such as benign vascular loops near the, uh, uh, the inner ear, but it can also be caused by um, ch changes in, in our vasculature due to um, intracranial neoplasm. Continuing with the red flags and signs of secondary headache, then this list just expands on that snoop mnemonic that we saw on the previous slide. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but you can see the references on the page there. Uh, so if you want to explore this in a bit more detail, this will just uh, it's, it kind of signposts you to be able to have a look at some of these uh, signs in a little bit more detail. And what you'll see from this is actually that there's there's a much broader set of uh, secondary headache disorders here or path pathophysiology that can present as secondary headache uh, as this the list that we're looking at within this video is 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 limited just to, to focusing on some of the common ones that you're likely to see in, in clinical practice. Starting with meningitis, then you're probably familiar with this idea of bacterial meningitis, and it's frequently referred to as a classic triad presentation that we have pyrexia, headache, and neck stiffness. And actually, as you drill down into the statistics around patients who present in this way, that you find actually that although there's a significant proportion of patients that present with this classical triad, it's actually the minority of patients who have all three that others may present initially with uh, one or two of these. Uh, however, what is common amongst patients with bacterial meningitis in particular is that they will present acutely unwell. And we're talking about a, a headache and these other symptoms that will develop over quite a short period of time. You know, they're going to develop over several hours to days as opposed to days to weeks. And if we look at the, the, the diagram on the right, I'm, I'm, often, I'm, I'm often not a big fan of this kind of, of, of medical information being presented in this way. That I know this is usually uh, aimed at the general public and, and for them to have some awareness of this. However, I, I did think that this makes quite a nice background image and uh, verifying the, uh, the information in this diagram here, this actually... Uh, corresponds with the uh, the references that I'm providing in the reference list as well that this th these are some of the signs to look out for um, so our associated symptoms then alongside the headache that we see in meningitis uh, are nausea and vomiting they're quite common um, associated sy symptoms and you're probably all familiar with the, uh, the photophobia or, or here I've written photalgia because really it's 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 not just an aversion to the light that it, it's it's pain when people um, are exposed to the light. Uh, they're likely to be drowsy and obviously we're considering patients presenting with headache. However, if, if a patient presents further down the line, then they, they may, may attend already with loss of consciousness um, and experiencing coma. And so they, they would obviously present via um, ambulance with regard to our history taking, as well as exploring the presenting complaint uh, in, in order to make a diagnosis of meningitis, it can also be really useful to explore uh, whether, whether or not they have a, a history of exposure. For example, uh, if they've been exposed to other people around them that have had similar symptoms and have had a, a diagnosis of meningitis, um, whether or not they've been exposed to any environmental factors, or, or risk factors. For example, uh, people who work with animals such as rodents or farm animals, they'll be at an increased risk of certain bacteria that can uh, expose them to, uh, to developing meningitis. Uh, in, in particular, ingesting unpasteurized dairy products. Uh, I haven't said much about viral meningitis, however, uh, ascertaining a sexual history can be useful as uh, exposure to uh, herpes simplex virus uh, through sexual intercourse, uh, in particular uh, risky sexual practices, so if people have been uh, partaking in high risk sexual practices, this is more likely to expose them to human, uh, herpes simplex virus and this can uh, 
lead to viral meningitis. Uh, just as sexual uh, risky sexual practices is going to put them at an increased risk of HIV, uh, which therefore, due to being Im immunocompromised, will put them at an increased risk of developing meningitis. Next on our list is subarach subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, I mentioned before that part of the classic presentation here is this thunderclap headache. Uh, so uh, this is a very specific onset of headache where it happens extremely rapidly uh, usually as people are um, either exercising or, or doing something active e even um, during sexual intercourse um, they will frequently describe this as the, the worst headache of their life it tends to be posterior or in the base of the skull with some uh, neck stiffness uh, there are some other there's some overlap here in terms of the, the, the signs and symptoms between subarachnoid hemorrhage and uh, meningitis we've said that these patients are, are potentially going to have some photophobia and signs of meningeal uh, irritation so some uh, we've mentioned uh, neck stiffness uh, but they're also likely to have some, some back pain um, and bilateral leg pain they may even have some visual changes I've included here a decision-making tool for the clinical diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage, which comes on top of the, the thunderclap uh, headache. Um, if they're age 40 years or older, um, and in particular, if, if they have a, a, a witnessed loss of consciousness, um, if they're complaining of, of neck pain or stiffness, which we've already mentioned, um, they're likely to vomit and uh, attend with a diastolic blood pressure of more than 100 millimeters of mercury and a systolic pressure of more than 160 millimeters of mercury. In addition to this, you may have also heard of this idea of sentinel headaches or a kind of a, a prodrome, and we mentioned prodrome in relation to migraine, uh, but in terms of subarachnoid hemorrhage, what that means is a proportion of um, patients who uh, suffer subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, experience some prodromal events in the hours or days running up to uh, this sudden onset of thunderclap headache. This is somewhere between 10 to 50 percent of patients and this can include a uh, headache but this would be of uh, less severity uh, than the, the thunderclap headache itself. It might include dizziness, double vision or some some visual loss cranial nerve palsies and memory loss are present in around 25 percent of these patients uh, and this is after the actual subarachnoid hemorrhage itself so not as part of prodrome but once they, they've uh, uh, um, presented acutely uh, this is most likely to be uh, oculomotor nerve palsy as uh, the uh, as the the condition develops, they're likely then to, to develop a, um, a reduction in their Glasgow coma scale and they can develop uh, hydrocephalus either as part of the acute or, or, or developed um, af after the, the initial event. Um, so they'd be therefore displaying signs of uh, increased uh, intracranial hemorrhage. So this is very much a medical emergency and if you suspect subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, then this, this needs to be dealt with uh, with, with the, the utmost importance, really. Uh, finally, in this presentation, uh, we'll talk a little bit about space occupying lesion and the headaches associated with that. And anecdotally, uh, this, is, this is often a question that patients have in their minds when they attend for help with, with headache, that it's one of the, the first things that people often think about. Uh, they, they, they have headaches that are bothering them and a lot of people are really concerned that they have a brain tumour. And for us as clinicians, this can also be very difficult because this is something that we are going to be concerned about. We're going to be looking for red flags um, and we don't want to uh, risk any potential for for, for missing a space, space, occupying, space occupying lesion that's intracranial. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, many patients who are diagnosed with uh, a brain tumour will present with very similar 
symptoms to those of primary headache, where, which increases the risk that we're going to, to miss something. The onset of symptoms are likely to be insidious, so they're going to develop over a, a longer period of time. Uh, that is, unless they do have an acute bleed from uh, a tumour, or if a uh, space occupying lesion occludes the third ventricle, in which case uh, patients would present with the uh, signs and symptoms of hydrocephalus. Unfortunately, headache is often a late sign of intracranial neoplasm. And what this means is that it's usually not an isolated finding. So we're looking for patients who uh, may well present with headache, but they're likely to have other uh, signs and symptoms, in particular um, signs within the neurological examination. Within the case study work that goes alongside these sessions, you will have seen that I have presented a uh, neurological uh, screening assessment and a, uh, a headache specific assessment that takes components of the neurological exam, the cranial nerve examination, uh, the ENT and ophthalmic examination puts them together in a, uh, a concise uh, assessment for patients with headaches. And you're using those neurological tests to try and expose some neurological dysfunction uh, if you're suspicious that there's a space occupying lesion. Uh, these patients are also potentially going to uh, attend with nausea or vomiting or possibly both. Uh, and we know that the, the side of the head is it, sorry, the side of the, the head on which the pain uh, presents um, is ipsilateral to that of the tumour. Um, so, for example, that uh, we know that uh, headaches here might uh, masquerade as migraine type symptoms, which we know are unilateral. And one of the difficulties that we have for uh, differentiating a diagnosis here is that we, we need to rule out any space occupying lesion. Um, so if a patient presents with right sided migraine, we're trying to uncover any um, uh, right, uncover any uh, neurological deficit associated with the right side of the brain. That brings us to the end of this two part series on headache. It is only an overview of these, uh, these headache disorders, but hopefully it will have given you a good start with regard to understanding some of them and being able to uh, look into them in a bit more detail. I hope you've enjoyed these videos. and Thank you very much for watching.